Welcome, everybody. This is a humorous history podcast, and we are, in fact, the Goofy Historians. It's a homemade drum roll. I got more control over it. Today, we are going to finish up our multi-part series on the Mongols. If you didn't get a chance to watch the other ones, you go. You need to do that, but not now. When you're finished with this one, go back. There's some great titles. Um, don't miss... Um, the Mongols and their horses. That's a short video where we talked about the Mongols and their relationship that they were so attached to their horses like nobody ever else was. They rode on their horses, they slept on their horses, they drank from their horses, and sometimes they ate their horses. We have one called Genghis Khan's Great Escape. Uh, this is when Genghis Khan was a child or a very young man he escaped down a river with his head in a table you don't want to miss that one um marco polo's one million lies that was the book bestseller um poor guy nobody believed all his details about china and last but not least all the animated videos um we have three animated videos out there um, i think the first one is the best it's called a hamster named genghis also we have one I don't want to forget the first industrial revolution. It talks about, I think, the Song Dynasty and how amazing they were with their paper money before anybody else. Um, so those are going to be great. Tune in for this whole video on this one because it's going to be a great video. Um, and if you do like it, um, consider supporting us on Patreon. I'll put the link to the Patreon in the description of this video. Today, we are honored to have our special guest with us from the country of New Zealand. He's our, he's our anonymous guest. He's calling in from a secure um, landline over a Skype link. Um, and he's totally anonymous. I'm just kidding. Um, his name is Ali and we go, we go way back. He has his own channel called Gates of Babylon. So we'll put the link to his channel so you can check his channel out and um you know i'll get ali on here in a second but he's an impressive young man and i've already learned a lot from ali let me give you a few examples i learned that there are no kangaroos in new zealand um which is great now i can visit new zealand because i'm terrified of, of kangaroos it's terrifying creatures um, but no, seriously, I did learn a lot. He's got a great working knowledge of history, not only of um, like the Ottomans and stuff, but also Romans and Chinese. Um, and just overall, he's a great resource to kind of explain to white people some of the questions that we have, like, you know, what's the difference between Sunni and Shia and stuff like that. Um, by the way, it's more like Orthodox versus Catholicism, not like Catholicism versus Lutheran. Anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I have a question for you, Ali. Um, the question I have for you is, is Lord the best recording artist New Zealand can come up with? I mean, her album Royals, that, that was a pretty good album, but frankly, her new stuff, just kidding. That's not my question. My, my question is, finally, I'll get to you. <laughs> my question is, you're when do the Mongols come in? <laughs> never. They're never, never. going to come in. No Mongols. The Mongols are too boring. <laughs> no, Ali, my question is, what are you studying at university? Yep, uh, let's start first. How are you guys? Uh, and welcome to the uh, to the channel go for your soon and hopefully this is going to be a fantastic ride okay um well i'm studying right now uh computer science uh, i didn't choose comp engineering because it's one extra year and the first year is basically full of maps and physics and i did that in high school so i said like just do computer science it's in the end in the field you're going to do the same thing it's not this isn't a different so three years computer science hopefully next year's uh uh, the last year um, that's in terms of a study and and the goal of my channel is basically to unlock the, the secrets of Babylon of history 
that's a big uh that's a that's a big task <laughs> yeah the bigger the task the the more fulfilling i think yeah as they say well that's pretty interesting it's, stuff yeah. we're, we're glad to have you with us here um to talk about the part of the mongols history where where they go west and, and they go um, nuts yeah and they go nuts Joe, so north. How, how does this whole thing start when they're when they're going west because we talked about china already and we talked about how they consolidated mm-hmm. all the steppe people but why did they even want to go to the west yeah right. well, it, well yeah. okay so for ali and everybody uh again we're the goofy historians so we're not the great sources if you're writing a report or something this is an ad hoc conversation but there are good sources out there so uh you can listen to us for fun but uh dan carlin has a five-part series on the mongols and he's very good if you really want to get into some depth you do dan carlin also, the Great Courses has a great series of courses on uh, the, the the Mongol Empire. So, if you listen to what we do, the silly part of it, and you go, "Wow, I'm going to check up some of that stuff," start with Dan Carlin, and if you can afford it, go to the Great Courses and look at what they have to say. Great, great courses, and there's a lot of books, and there's a lot of you know like actual books that were written. And what's interesting, this is to get into to when they go west when they go into the Islamic empires, empire, a lot of the, when they went into China, right, a lot of this material on the Mongols wasn't written until after the Yuan dynasty, which was the Mongolian dynasty, left. So most of the history of the Mongols in China was written by the Ming, right? So there was like 300 years separation between when the history was written and, and when it happened. And so they're a little distant and they're very academic and they're very accurate, extremely accurate, but seems to be very academic. The Islamic empires, when they were taken, there's a lot of people who wrote at the time when it was happening. And it was a very literate culture and maybe uh, Ali can talk about that. So you get some really raw, really raw responses of what's happening at that time so none of this stuff is like it's when we're going when we're going west there is there is contemporary documents about what happened so this is not something historians you know made up later on the internet this is actually eyewitnesses of what was going on and it's horrific it's truly truly horrific for example, in World War II with Hitler, 2%, 3% of the world population got annihilated, died, right? When you're talking about the Mongols, right? You're talking maybe 12 to 20% of the population died. The only thing that's even close to that is the Black Plague, where maybe 40% of the population died, right? So we're talking at that level of destruction. So how did that happen? You know, it's, that's, well, that's the eternal question. But so when when uh, Genghis Khan, he was Genghis at that time, he, he first went into Jin, Jin China and Shishia China, which wasn't even ruled by the Chinese at that time. Um, he was beginning to take over them mainly to keep his troops occupied because after you've, they spent 2000 years killing each other, more or less, right? You have to, and once you unite them, that's all they know, right? They, they have nothing to trade. They have, they have no culture, they have no literature. All they know is fighting. So you have to burn off this energy. And so why not you go down and attack the Jin and the Shishia? Uh, and when, he, when they were doing that, they, they got a lot of wealth and gold. And it's almost like the uh, drug cartels of Mexico or uh, Colombia, they wanted to go legit. So they wanted to like, uh, wash this loot and so they got a caravan and they sent this caravan west to to trade with the islamic empire so at that time he was almost like um 
clue some of the drug lords I was trying to uh, launder their money. He was there. He was trying to go west. And he Pablo, went into Pablo Escobar. And the thing is that Escobar, they, right? So he was like doing the Escobar thing. It was like he, he had no intention of conquering the Islamic empires, but he got into the city called Ultra in uh, Charismian. And um, maybe Ali can talk about how that empire came about because they were Turkish, I guess, and they were like ruling over a Persian uh, the, era the of population. 50 50. The 50 50. 50. 50 Persian, there's a Persian side and there's a Turkish side because um, yeah. the Turks were like fighting each other, the so different Turkish tribes, and one comes to the power, the other one comes and takes the power. So there was uh, like chaos for like a whole century, or even slightly more, more or less like the War of the Roses, Mexa <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with a hundred years war or the 116 war. Uh -huh. All yeah. of that mix it with. Uh, imagine if there's another war coming, uh, going on. All that, but, but more or less, it's like that. That's what's going on in Persia at the time. Okay. Yeah. But and... it's mostly political. There isn't like really a lot of uh, battlefields. There's a little. Bit, there's more sieges than battlefields. Uh, but even the number of the sieges are not really much. Most of it, it's like assassination business and, you know, court uh, conflict and that type of thing. No, right. so a this, lot of this, warfare. Right. So this was the beginning of the Turkish expansion. This was before the Ottomans, obviously. Right. This was like hundreds of years before the Ottomans created their empire. Yeah, yeah. But it was the Turkish coming down, mm -hmm. and they had just taken this land. So the uh, Charismian Empire was relatively new, right? It was only like this is like the first generation or the second generation of the Charismian generation. Empire that they just taken land away from. You know the what? Persians. I think I think that if Genghis, I think if because Genghis. This whole thing went sideways because Genghis thought that he was like an equal and he should be treated like equal with these guys and they disrespected him. That's what well, he, he was totally disrespected. That's what yeah, happened. Like, like, he, got, he got disrespected and he overreacted. That's all. Yeah. He, he over well, because he, uh, he was, he was dissed. I mean, he was the, he was your crazy cousin up north who came down to visit for, for Thanksgiving and nobody wanted him, right? I mean, one of the funny things I heard, one thing that really horrified the Chinese, and I don't know about the Islamic, but it's probably the same, is that when you're a, when you're a Mongol up on your horses, you just get your big slab of meat and you cut it on your shield and you eat it, right? If you go to a Chinese restaurant, you never have a whole slab of meat on your plate, right? It's like you you do all the chopping and filleting somewhere else, right? And you mix it, you mix it with your hundreds of different vegetables and spices. And when you bring it out to the table, it doesn't even look like a cow anymore. So when the Mongols took over China, the first thing they saw was these people like getting slabs of meat with a with with a sword. Uh, so they they were you know no chopsticks needed when you're a Mongol, right? So yeah, the uh, Muslim they, side uh, the Muslim side got used to that because uh, the Turks are they are more or less similar in a lot of things uh, to the Mongols. So already that happened there before the Mongols come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the Turkish well. You know, a lot of them were coming down from the steps too at that time, like the Han. Yeah. But I assume that over in uh, Baghdad, in in the uh, Abyssid, what do you call it? Uh, uh, the, Abbasid, the Abyssid yeah. Empire. Yeah, but uh, but the Abbasid uh, at Abbasid. that time, yeah, Abbasid. Uh, at that time, they were shrunk. All that left is just Baghdad and Kabul towns uh, around it. Well, you, they still around. If they if they kind of have power more or less you can think about it like the shogunate in japan where the emperor like does nothing but technically the, he has a name over power and everybody fights in the name of the emperor but more or less like that however okay. the main yeah. power of the of the of the caliph or kind of caliph is a sultan but all, betrays himself as a caliph because okay. uh, you know most muslims recognize that only the first caliph that actually caliphate all the others. Yeah, right. So the caliphate uh, yeah. is still a technically, and but Baghdad was still huge. It was the center of civilization at that. Yeah, time, it was right? nearly two million people in the city. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. city of so, the wall. Were, the were time, they, yeah. what they, 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 this is going to sound stupid, but remember, we're two old white guys from America. Were they Sunnis or Sushi or 
what was going on there? Or, what was it was the difference between the Charismian and the Abbasids? Um, the, all the Turks are Sunni. There's no you won't find a Turk that is Shia. Uh, I don't know why, but that's just how it is. So okay. All, all, the entire area is controlled by Sunnis, except Sunnis. for yeah, except for one particular slice of land, like a tiny strip in the in the north of uh, Iran, uh, like I'm talking about geography in modern day Iran, where where they have you know the Caspian Sea. There's a uh -huh. little bit of mountains yeah. there. That yeah. area is not controlled by the the caliphate or any Arab okay. empire at all, because there's a lot of castles built there on top of the mountains. And it's uh, really hard. And okay. then the Mongols also took them down because they annoyed the Mongol too. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. But they happened like way later. When I was, so, I was when I was listening to Dan Carlin when he was talking about when the Mongols put a siege. I know I'm jumping ahead here, but when they um, put the siege engines against um, Baghdad, um, and they ran out of you know, stones and stuff, and there were no rocks. And I guess there was a lot of palm trees and all the water and everything before they messed up the dikes. But they would just take entire um, palm trees and put it in their catapults and throw giant trees yeah. over the walls. Yeah. 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 Just, it was yeah. so yeah. awful. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you're listening to this, you're probably going to wonder, like, how did the Mongols get siege technology? Well, they got it from the Chinese. <laughs> and then they, they, they got it from the northern Chinese. And then when they conquered the, the Islamic uh, empires, they even got better siege and, um, equipment and then went down and conquered uh, southern China. So the one thing the Mongols were good at was incorporating whatever technology they could find in, including bureaucracy they didn't have a bureaucracy so they usurped bureaucracy from other countries and uh uh an alphabet they they took their alphabet from the the uyghurs i guess so you know they they, they did they, they were trying to become civilized it was back to ultra we got distracted so so poor little khan is trying to go legit wash this money he's got all this loot from china he gets into ultra which is a city in the charismian empire which is sort of like in uzbekistan now i don't know it's one of the Tur one of the stands and mm -hmm. um he gets in there this city thinking oh, look at we're here we're, we're going legit why don't you trade with this and this mayor of ultra which happens to be the brother-in-law of muhammad the second the the uh shah of this whole thing he, he kills all of, all of, I mean, it's horrible. I mean, it's, this is really is a horrible thing, what he did. He went there and he killed all the, all of the people who part of this caravan. And it was a huge caravan and he took all of the money, right? And Muhammad II with his sister, um, said, well, that's fine. Just, just split with us 50-50. And you know we'll be fine. And I mean, these these have a bunch of step people, right? And like they're not going to do anything. <laughs> Besides, they're busy in China, right? China's beating their beating their ass right now. They're stuck. They're in a quagmire in China. So we're going to be fine. Big mistake, big mistake. But the bigger mistake, because uh, Genghis Khan was busy in in China, right? And he goes, I. I just want to finish this one task in China. Will you please, you know, let's focus. Let's focus. Because he, he had a hard time focusing. He had no cerebral cortex. It was like impulse control was not part of his forte, right? But he, he does. He's, he's polite. He sends another messenger to them and says, that was a big mistake. I'm sure you're sorry. I'm sure you're really sorry. So send this mayor of Otra to me, along with the loot, right? And we'll call it even, and I'll send another caravan and we'll start over where we will reboot because I do not want to fight you. And then, but remember the mayor of Ultra was the brother of the sister, was, was, was the brother, right, of, of Muhammad II's wife, right? So, I mean, I'm sure she, and she was pre a pretty big personality and he goes, nah, so he just takes these new messengers, these new diplomats. What does he do to him? He kills a couple of them and he shaves the other 
something, he shaves them or burns their face and sends them back um, saying that, no, we're going to keep your loot and you, you, you just keep your business in China. Um, but that was, that was the, the big mistake. And uh, that really pissed. Now, what, what, what happened was terribly wrong. It was terribly unjust. It was very stupid. But what Genghis God t did was like a thousand X, right? I mean, you would want to punish Muhammad II. Maybe you'd want to destroy his empire. But you don't want to destroy everybody in his empire. And that's what would happen. So, uh, 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 Ali can, uh, can uh, uh, speak to that. I think well, what the... Um, Go ahead. Um, so, in terms of uh, the destruction they did, um, my theory is um, they did it on purpose, not just for the sake of destruction. I think if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be able to hold to the empire for long because there's a whole lot of people there. Like the amount of people there, if the Mongols didn't kill them, Persia and the area around will have the same population as China now. Uh, some historians estimate that. So there's, there's so much cities, so much castles, so much soldiers. And, and, and also like the Persia from long time, like throughout history is a war, warrior culture. There's no man or woman that doesn't know how to use a sword or hunt. And if you know how to hunt, you could be used to shoot at somebody. So if they didn't take advantage of, uh, like from a Mongol perspective, of course, it's not ethical even in war, but from the Mongol perspective, if you don't kill them now, they will kill you later. Uh, but I, I don't think the the, the Charisman Empire, I don't even think that the people were happy with Muhammad II. They probably would have been happy working with the Mongols to overthrow him. But it, yeah, that's, in that's some true. cases, yeah. I mean, this is, it was just, it was just genocide, right? Where one of the descriptions of the eyewitnesses was, this is what like horrified me, or there's a lot of, lot of, lot of eyewitnesses. One, this, this, this group of people was was coming it was actually an army right and they were coming and they saw like in the desert like a snow-covered mountain right and they go what's a snow-covered mountain doing in the middle of the desert right and as they got closer they realized they were walking through like this this black oil gray type stuff that was flowing on the ground and their 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 horses feet were sticking to it and then it started smelling and what they realized when they got up, this was like a huge pile of bones, right? Like, you know, 30, 40 feet tall, right? Well, you could see that this, the flesh had just ripped. I mean, there's one thing to commit genocide, right? But you had to take extra effort. I mean, and it was a form of terrorism, right? Because like you said, if you can terrorize these people into submission, if you see, if you're coming on these people and you see a 20, 30 uh, foot pile of bones, right? And with the, all this decaying flesh around it, that's making, and some of the people even got sick and died just from smelling it. Maybe that will give you a second thought about attacking these people because that that is not normal warrior culture, I don't think. That, that goes beyond... <laughs> <laughs> that goes beyond yeah. just, I mean, because even when the Mongols were in Mongolia, right, and they conquered a person, they, they looked, they, they lined up their prisoners, and they compared it to a wagon wheel. And if you were smaller than a wagon wheel, you're, you lived, right? You can, you can come on and we'll like make you a wife or something. And, but if you're taller than a wagon wheel, then you, you get executed. Um, and then I mean, it's a warrior culture. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. But they didn't take all of the bones and put it in a big pile and let it rot so your enemies could see it. Um, um, the thing the thing was that um, the Mongol realized, ha caught away, that there's, some, there's something that people talk about. And uh, some, some people start to compare the Mongols at the beginning before they commit massive stuff, uh, uh, killing a ton of people. Because they just in the beginning, they did similar stuff in the first couple cities, they did similar stuff to what they did to China. And then the people start to compare that because that never happens 
at, at least once, but not many people saw it. All the people that saw it died uh, in Levant. One Muslim army, not exactly a Muslim, but like they technically they call themselves Muslims, did uh, genocide the entire city of Crusaders. Uh, but they only people hear about it, they didn't see it. But uh, there, people start to see it. And then the people start to compare them to Gog and Magog. So the, yes. then people start to think there are Gog and Magog from coming from the east, plus their faces a little bit met the description of what Prophet Muhammad told about Gog and Magog. Of course, that's a bit nonsense because uh, uh, all the other scholars, when they heard that, uh, they said, no, they don't fit the description fully, uh, like all the, the ones that are knowledgeable about it. But uh, by that time, it was already too late. Because uh, people s start to run away from them because in the Prophet Muhammad talk that if you see Gog and Magog, don't even try to fight, just run. You know, Gog and Magog from even, you know, in Christian Christendom, uh, they will come in the end of times. So with the thinking that's the end of times and Gog and Magog come, so that's why a, a lot of people didn't even fight. And then the Mongols uh, heard about it. Uh, there's evidence for that. I can share with you uh, uh, links for that. For that. Um, Later, but the Mongols start to hear about that, so they took advantage of it and start to do even more horrible things on purpose, because you know there's uh, the the free dogs of uh, the what we call them the dogs of Genghis Khan, uh, and their free uh, special units. One of them is Sabotai. Sabotai is, in my opinion, like the person that did most of the conquer for the Mongols. Like Genghis Khan didn't do much; they just like in terms of conquering, he did like the management, but in terms of conquering as a general, his mission stopped at Mongolia. After that, it's just Sibutai, uh, mostly. Yeah, I, I don't know. When he when he went into, I think he was certainly involved in 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 the Mongolia. He, he got that involved. It seems like he was involved in uh, uh, the Shishia. And I think he was still pretty involved when they got to... Um, when they got to uh, Bukhara, Samarkand, I mean, uh, certainly Ultra, well, well, not Ultra, except when it was his uh, son that attacked Ultra, but when they got to Bukhara, because uh, all four armies, he had him and his three sons and, and yeah. maybe uh, Subadai come in from all four sides and and d d d destroyed Bukhara, and then they went and got uh, um, Samarkand and some of the other, other cities like Merv, right, which was... Merv is a city, you know, that, that was around 4,000 years by that time, and they destroyed yep. it, and it's still destroyed to this day. Yeah, it um, disappeared. <laughs> they wiped it out, literally. They literally wiped it out. Um, and they not only wiped out Merv, right, uh, but all of the aqueducts and the irrigation canals, everything. So it, it, it could never, and, and it never did. It, I mean, if you go see it now, it's still just... It's still just ruins. So, you know, I, I don't know if there's any. Well, I, just like you're saying, there's um, there's no justification for the Black Plague. Things just happen, right? I mean, yeah, that that's where it happens. And I think Genghis Khan is something like that. I don't think anything good came of Genghis Khan, and um, except for people recovered, you know, and people people recovered yeah. from the Black Plague. I uh, think, uh, I think we I mean, could lasted still like four years think, and then people got better. I think we could still a Dan Carlin line here because he says that um, there's very few people in history that are a historical arsonist. And that's definitely how you could categorize Genghis Khan. He, he definitely didn't understand like the equal and appropriate response. Um, right. But I think that's only true for the Charismian, the Charismian Empire. Once he got out of the Charismian, I mean, he still, still slaughtered whole cities, right? It wasn't like he turned into a nice guy, but he turned back into a regular conqueror. Because you saw, like, in when he went into Russia, right? They stayed in Russia. They became the Golden Horde, right? Yeah. Uh, sure. um, the and when they when they finally took over Persia and, and Baghdad, they converted to Muslims so much for their you know tolerance of all religions. And when they went into China, you know, they basically accepted like the Confucian Buddhists. And when they, the ones who actually stayed in Mongolia became Buddhists. So it's not like they, 
you know, were, were tolerant of all religions as soon as they, they were more like stem cells, right? Whatever, whatever, whatever country you happen to conquer, that's the religion you became. Yeah, right? it's like our they cartoon. Really, it's like, yeah. As long as you keep praying for the con, you got to have a horse in every race. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It was sort of like Constantine with Christianity. It's like, yeah, it's like, uh, I'm not sure how sincere any of that was. I think some of them became very sincere later, but I don't think the first generations were sincere. I think they looked around and go, you guys are all Muslim. I think it's time I become a Muslim. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of them from the Muslim side has been criticized heavily from, from the same time period, like even like exactly in the same years lived with them, the other original muslims there like they're looking at them and saying you're not a muslim but they, they don't want to say it so they don't get executed yeah yeah they, so. they, they weren't fully a muslim and that's where especially even like the uh, other leaders will come later like related to jinkis khan like uh, tamur who's uh right possibly, after yeah yeah possibly a descendant of jinkis khan and you have the Mughals. And both of them did like a lot of horrible f things that no one in the Middle East were even a, a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim wouldn't, wouldn't sign up to. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. As you can see, we did run out of time. Um, we are going to do a supplemental video for this video where we'll finish talking about the Mongols in the Middle East and into Western Europe and even Russia. So stay tuned for that. And um, thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. You can follow along on our website um, at goofyhistorians.com show notes. And there's the show notes and you can read about this as well. Um, don't forget to check out Ali's channel. And um, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, everybody.